Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. On, the, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they had heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke to, by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage? and the people plot in vain. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. Today's sermon, as you can see, is a rather unusual title. Sounds kind of gross, and I promise it'll make more sense as we get into the message. But I want to start with this. This is a plaque that I have in my office. This is the soccer team at Wheaton College that I played for. This is in the fall of 1988 that this was taken. And we'll put a picture of this actually up on the screen to make it easier for you to see, and I don't have to hold it up there the whole time. But see if you can find me in that picture. Might have to look around a little bit. If you're not sure, I am squatting in the front row, far left in yellow. I was a goalkeeper, second stringer. Our starting goalie is to my left. He was six foot four. He definitely had a height advantage. He was much bigger and stronger, so he was a starter. I sat the bench, and I was ready to get in the game if he ever got hurt or if our team had a 10-goal lead. That's when I would go in. I didn't get a chance to play very often, but as you can see at the bottom of this plaque, we were 19-3-2 that year. We had an excellent team. And as the season went along, we had a pretty good winning streak going. It looked like we were going to make the playoffs. But in NCAA college soccer, even at the Division III level, it's pretty intense competition, pretty fierce. So you never know if you're going to make it into the playoffs. And one extra loss on your record could be it for you, no postseason playoffs. So the pressure's on to win as many games as you can so that you don't get overlooked when it comes to the playoff bid. Well, as the regular season this year was winding down, we came to the last game. And I honestly can't remember if the starting goalie got hurt or if he needed a rest, but I remember the coach, which was my dad, he said to me, JT, you're going to start on Friday. I am? This was after I swallowed really hard. Who are we playing? I didn't even know who was on the schedule that day. University of Chicago. Now, you think for somebody like me sitting on the bench most of the season that I would be excited about this opportunity to be the starting goalie in a big game, the last game of this, the regular season. But you know how I felt? I can remember clearly feeling this immediate sense of doom. The weight of this responsibility just hit me like a Mack truck. And instead of jumping at the chance to prove myself, I made an excuse. I had a class that day that I would have to skip if I was going to make it to that game. And so I told the coach, my dad, that I had to go to this class. This was part of my major. I shouldn't miss it. And so I didn't lie, but I exaggerated the importance of this class to the point 
that the coach had to call on the third string goalie, a freshman, to play in that game. So Friday came, game day. I went to my class, and it was utterly forgettable. I don't remember anything about that class, but what I do remember is that meanwhile, my third string freshman understudy ended up playing that day, and we beat the University of Chicago three to two. And I remember thinking to myself afterwards, you coward. You should have been the one out there earning that victory. But it wasn't me. I chickened out. I made up an excuse, and I missed out on an opportunity to overcome my fear and achieve something that would have helped the team. And instead of stepping up, I backed down. I didn't have the guts to step on the playing field when my time to shine presented itself. This fall, I've been doing this preaching series, Go Fish. And it's all about Jesus calling his disciples to follow him. And so he went to the seashore. He found Peter, Andrew, James, and John. He said to them, if you follow me, I'll turn your life around. I'll make you something that you aren't right now. I'll make you fishers of men. And so those guys, plus a few others that Jesus called, they took the message, they shared it with others who shared it with a few more and a few more and on down through the centuries. Now we benefit from that message being passed down over and over again to us today. And the sermon title for today, Fish Guts, it refers to the fact that it takes guts to share the gospel message. It takes courage to talk about Jesus You have to muster up a certain amount of bravery to do that. And you can't chicken out and make excuses. It means stepping up to your responsibility as a Christian and taking advantage of all the opportunities that you have. Sometimes we get scared to share the message because it's intimidating. We don't want to say something wrong, lead people astray. Or we don't want to offend somebody. Or we don't want to get a question that we can't answer. Or we could get rejected, ignored, laughed at, canceled. There's a whole bucket list of reasons why you might not want to share your faith. And you might think, well, I'm glad that somebody else told me about Jesus, but don't expect me to do that because that's not my gift. Well, maybe not, but every believer is equipped and expected to share their faith. You remember that song, This Little Light of Mine? I'm going to let it shine. And then it says, are you going to hide it under a bushel? No. No, you're going to let it shine. We're supposed to let our light shine so that others can find their way in the dark to a Savior. And it's that message, that's it. That's simple. Now the first week of this series, I gave everyone a homework assignment. Maybe you remember that. You were hoping I forgot. I asked you to write a letter to the person that led you to Jesus. Now, that person might not even be alive anymore, but I told you to write it anyway. And I still want you to write that letter if you haven't done that yet, because it reminds us all that we were fish once. We needed someone to tell us. And it might motivate us to move past our own fear and move toward our understanding of what it means to be fishers of men. Now, I read my letter to my parents as an example to you, and I actually sent that letter to my parents. As soon as they got it, they called me and they cried all the way through it. Tears of joy, of course. And again, maybe you don't mail yours, but I still hope that you take time to write it, because if you don't, the homework's going to pile up on you, because I have another homework assignment for you at the end of this message, so stay tuned for that. But the Christian message, the gospel... The good news, the reason we need to talk about it is because it's not intuitive. You can't figure it out on your own. Christianity is something that's grounded in history. It's an event based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that's something that happened long ago that has to be passed on. We can't arrive at a conclusion about the gospel just through our own intuitive knowledge. It has to be handed down. So if you're a Christian, you know this. Somebody told you about Jesus. But we still have a tendency to shrink back. 
We're afraid, like I said, if someone asks a hard question. Or what if they walk away? Or what if they do this? What if they do that? And we feel guilty. And we know that we ought to, but we're afraid. It's like that last game of the season back in college for me. I shied away from playing in a game because I was afraid of failure. You know, I think it would help all of us to remember that the disciples were cowards too. When Jesus was arrested, all his best friends scattered. They ran away. Peter denied knowing Jesus. And he told a little girl three times that he was definitely not a friend of Jesus. He was afraid of a little girl. But you see, in the book of Acts, these same cowards became very courageous about what they had seen and heard when it came to Jesus and his resurrection. And the reason they were so willing to fish, despite their fear, we see it in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 23. We continue the story that I told you two weeks ago. Peter and John, you remember, had healed a lame man, and they began sharing about Jesus, and the religious leaders got mad, and they threw Peter and John in jail. They ordered them not to talk about Jesus And they said to him, you can talk about Moses, you can talk about David, Isaiah, any of the other prophets, but Jesus, you just can't talk about him. None of that other religious talk bothers us, but Jesus, he's offensive, so you need to shut up about that. And you remember how the story goes? Peter and John, they didn't back down. They said, no, we have to talk about Jesus because there's no other name under heaven that can save you. And so if we don't talk about it, nobody's going to know. So the religious leaders gave them a stern warning, just let them go, release them. And so that's where the story ended last time I preached. And so let's pick it up there. Peter and John are now on their way home after this very intense confrontation with the Sanhedrin. They spend a night in jail. And when they get back to their people who were praying for them, all night for their safety. And by the way, they needed those prayers to deliver them because remember, the religious leaders were very powerful people. If they had enough leverage to convince the Roman government to crucify Jesus, how hard would it be to do away with the disciples? The Pharisees were very powerful, dangerous people, and so you can see why the followers of Jesus would be up all night praying for Peter and John when they were thrown in jail. They were praying that God would protect them from being crucified themselves. Peter and John, their lives were really in jeopardy, and their friends back home at headquarters, they had to assume the worst. They knew that the Sanhedrin was capable of doing the same thing that they did to Jesus. And so here we are, Acts chapter 4, verse 23. It says, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. Now we'll stop right there. What do you think they prayed? Well, this is an amazing prayer. And it's kind of like this. Here's a picture of a bunch of trees. Do you see the trees? How many of you see something other than trees? Okay, if you look closely at the branches and the birds, they form the shape of a woman's face. Do you see that? If you're able to connect all the dots, it kind of forms this picture that kind of makes you go, ah, it's an aha moment when you see it. Now, what does this have to do with the prayer of these believers? Well, I think they had an aha moment. They remembered the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. When Peter and John came back from being thrown in jail, they realized that this is exactly what was foretold in Psalm chapter 2. And suddenly they realized that they are players in this great narrative that God has been writing and preparing for hundreds of years. They see the big picture. And here's what they pray. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, You spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. 
This psalm that they were taught as children is now coming to their mind, and it's about how the Messiah would come and not be accepted. And it was happening right then and there. The kings and rulers had gathered against the Lord's anointed and rejected him. Then they continued the same train of thought. The prayer went on, verse 27. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. You see, for those early believers, it was all coming together now. The disciples see it clearly, and they realize we're right in the middle of a fulfillment of prophecy. We get it. God, this was your plan all along. You are the sovereign God, they start that prayer out by saying. And here's why God is sovereign. Verse 28. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. What you wanted to happen, God, took place. Herod and Pontius Pilate, they thought they were in control. The religious leaders thought they were clever and knew what they were doing. But they played right into your hand to accomplish what you had ordained was supposed to happen all along. I can imagine how this might have been a little embarrassing for the early believers to realize, man, we didn't see it at first. We didn't get it. We were there when the guards came to arrest Jesus, and instead of realizing that this was all of part of God's plan, we ran like a bunch of pansies into the olive trees of the Garden of Gethsemane. We were such cowards. And we thought, good grief. You know, Peter probably said, a little girl made me cuss her out and deny Jesus three times. I didn't see it at the time. I thought the devil's plan had won, but this is what God had in mind from the beginning. It's an aha moment. And then the prayer shifts. In verse 29, they make their request. Okay, now, arrest and persecution may be part of the plan. We know that. But what do we pray for? They start off by saying, Lord, consider their threats. Consider their threats. They don't ask to avoid arrest and persecution because now they realize maybe that's part of the plan. They ask God to listen to the threats that are being made against them. And then they ask something that very few people ever pray for. They said, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Do this one thing, they pray. Give us great boldness. Have you ever prayed this? Enable me to speak your word confidently, with boldness. We don't usually pray that way because we usually pray that God will bless us and protect us. But they didn't pray for blessing or protection. They prayed, God, make us bold as lions. Christians don't pray that way very much anymore. Maybe it's because we don't think about the big picture and what God is up to. What these disciples had woken up to was the fact that God is saying, I want you to be players on this big stage of my great plan. And I want you to get across this message, the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see, we don't understand God's sovereignty. We think... God's controlling everything and that we have no responsibility, but that's wrong. We need to be active players. We can't shrink back. We have to get off the bench and get on the field. And that requires boldness, no matter what the cost. Because here's the reality. When it comes to witnessing and evangelism, that is sharing your faith, you might be a lot like this guy that I introduced you to earlier. I wish I could go back and tell this cowardly goalie with the dark brown mullet to not be such a wimp. Stand up and be more bold. Don't be afraid to take a risk. But that's just it. You might think, well, I'm not really a bold person. I'm quiet. I'm shy. Listen, it's not about being loud and outgoing. You don't have to change your personality in order to be bold. And I'm not telling you to get out there with a blowhorn. 
or to stand up on a soapbox on the street corner because it's not about visibility or volume. Boldness can be soft-spoken. Being bold means praying for people who are spiritually lost. It's handing out a CD or a book to someone who needs it. It's giving a smile or a hug to somebody that's hurting. It's inviting someone to come to an event. Speaking up when the opportunity presents itself. Speaking into people's lives. It's simply using your personality, your gifts and talents naturally to influence others spiritually. That's fish guts. Have the guts to become a fisher of men. Again, it's not about volume or having charisma. It can be a soft-spoken word of encouragement, a Bible verse, a letter, a text, a visit, an invitation, a prayer, all of those things. That's boldness, not being ashamed. Remember what I said at the start of this series? You are perfectly positioned in someone else's life to make a difference. Take advantage of those opportunities. Because God is at work in a sovereign way, and our attitude needs to be, hey, I want to help God get the message to other people. So any word or even a whisper, boldly spoken, can make an eternal difference in someone's life. Now let's wrap this up. Remember I told you at the beginning that there was going to be a homework assignment? I did not forget. For this week, you don't have to write down anything, but you're just going to add something to your prayers. I want you to pray this, Lord. Enable me to speak your word with boldness. Look on the front of your bulletin. It's that verse that's printed on there. What would happen if we began to pray this way? If we just began to ask God to help us to be bold? If you do, if you pray this way, I guarantee you two things at least will happen. You'll become more aware of the opportunities that you have. And number two, you'll be forced to face your fears and get in the game. Even if you fail, at least you've made the attempt. And every attempt that you make, you get more confident. So let it be known what you stand up for. Let your faith be known. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. We should be bold because God is still as sovereign today as he was back then. And Jesus said, I will build my church and hell will not prevail against it. So what are we afraid of? We've been invited to be players in God's unfolding plan. We've been invited to take the field. So how in the world can we sit on the sidelines? He's given us the privilege of being part of that big picture. And our only job is to be faithful witnesses of what we've seen and heard. That's it. We don't have to worry about the outcomes. We leave that up to God. We just worry about telling others, and God will take care of the results. Now, before I close in prayer, I want to just pause. And we're going to take a look at the message in a different way through a song. So just watch and listen. What can I do with this fire on the inside? I'm burning up with the truth I can't hide. You're the reason for this hope in my life. I'm gonna let it shine. I have to let it shine
Let's pray. Lord, this is what we live for, to do what you say, to go where you go, to be a bright light in a world full of darkness and pain. So use us, Lord. Enable us to speak your word, to live your truth, to lift up your name with boldness. Congregation, do you get it? Yes. Amen. Well, there's a, a verse at the end of the passage that was read today that I hope you didn't miss. Verse 31, it says, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God, what? Boldly. Could you imagine what that would be like? As soon as you pray, the whole building shakes. You understand, our prayers shake things up. So that's what I'm calling all of us to do as a congregation. Let's pray boldly, let's speak boldly, and live the truth boldly as we go about our week. Amen? Amen. Go in peace.